Thank you, Lord. <laughs> may, may, may we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the joy and the privilege that we have of meeting as, your, as the body of Christ and meeting to worship you. Heavenly Father, open our hearts and minds to receive from you, we pray. And Lord Jesus, the living word, will you speak into them, we pray. Amen. So yeah, new sermon series. I think probably what would be good is if we very quickly, or briefly, just review exactly where we are in the Old Testament. Here are the children of Israel. God has brought them out of Egypt through the Red Sea. Under the leadership of first Moses and then Joshua, they had entered the Promised Land. Because of everything God had done for them, the future most certainly looked bright. But then during the period of Judges, things went from good to bad, and from bad to very bad, or worse. And the comment that the Bible makes repeatedly in the book of Judges, it says this, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everybody was in effect their own king. So selfishness and chaos ruled. They worshipped God, but they also worshipped the gods of the nations that they invaded. So they were a people who had everything going for them, and yet they basically rebelled from God. And it's set against this backdrop that God moves in response. And he moves primarily to the prophet Samuel, after whom these two books are named. So this morning, I think it'll be good just to begin by looking at the narrative of his birth. And there's three questions I want to ask. Firstly, what is so reassuring about this account? Secondly, why is it so significant? And then thirdly, I've just got a question for you all. Have you decided yet? Firstly, let me tell you just why this passage is so reassuring to me. It's because even the great priests of the ancients could be completely incompetent. I can't tell you how relieved I am to know that I'm not alone. I mean, verse 9 to 14, it's like a scene, if they were to make a film of it, it's like a scene that you'd see from the Vicar of Dibley or Rev. And yet it's there in the Bible. There's, there's Hannah who's beside herself in tears because she's been barren for such a very long time. She's utterly grief-stricken. And then there's Eli, the priest who looks on. And he sees her mouthing words that she's just feeling too deeply to say out loud. I don't know if you've ever been in that position where your feelings are just so strong um, that you couldn't even vocalise them. And if you tried, you'd, you'd just break down. That's how Hannah is here. Her tears are flowing, though. But she can't talk. She can't articulate everything that's on her heart. Her tears are, in effect, her prayers. And she's just pouring them out to God. And here, then, is Eli, the great priest, who's looking on, and what does he assume? He says, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. It's as, if, it's as if the logical deduction, when a lady comes into the worship place, kneels down, starts to weep, and is mouthing something in the presence of the Lord, it's as if the thing to do is to discern that she must be drunk. I mean, as I've read that, I can definitely imagine Dawn French or Tom Holland there. I suppose what I want to say is, the point is, if, if you ever feel like you're rubbish at your job or in your role, then just reread those verses with a smile. I know I did. And you can reassure yourself that we all make mistakes sometimes. It's okay. God will work out his purposes anyway. Just as he does here at the beginning of the first book of Samuel. 
Because the scene is actually very significant, which is a, a second to answer my second question, as it were. For although it's quite comical initially, what we have here in chapter 1, it is a desperate and heartfelt prayer that God will answer to direct the future course of human history. Hannah, as I say, who is barren, she prays earnestly for a child. And once she knows that that prayer is going to be answered, chapter 2 then begins with her singing a wonderful psalm of praise to God. And it's a song that actually brilliantly foreshadows the opening events of Luke's Gospel. And a similar song that Mary will sing of, uh, of praise to God for her baby Jesus. And that's become known as the Magnificat. And the similarities are actually striking. You've got two meek and mild but faithful and prayerful childless women. And both will dedicate their child's life to the will and service of God. And we've got a baby that would steer and reverse the fortunes of firstly an entire nation in Samuel's case and then the entire world in Jesus's. And they would both sing prayers of praise and adulation to God for, for their child. They would both talk about how God brings down the proud and raises up the humble. And they would both talk about how God and his wonderful purposes will be fulfilled through them. Hannah's song begins, My heart rejoices in the Lord. And Mary's song begins, My soul glorifies the Lord. And so the child Samuel, as we're going to hear, the child Samuel would grow up to become, in effect, the last judge of Israel. He would be the prophet through whom God would speak to establish first the kingship of Saul and then the kingship of David, the saviour of all Israel. And the kingship of David and his children's children would be the line of kings that would eventually culminate in Jesus Christ, the ultimate king who would be the saviour of all the world, of all who would turn to him. So my final question, have you made a decision yet? A decision about where God is going to be in your life. And the reason I'm asking that this morning is because that decision shouldn't just begin and end with you. What about your children? What about your children's children? Hannah made a decision to dedicate her only son to God. In verse 11 she makes that vow. She said this, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. And she did. And Samuel became one of the great heroes of faith in the entire Bible. Have you? And do you? Dedicate your children and grandchildren to God. I mean, really. Because aren't they purely and simply the most precious things of all in your life? If you're lucky enough to have them. God has given them to us, right? Those who are lucky enough and have been blessed to have them. They're a gift from God to us. Such a gift that we really should be thanking God for daily. Do we? I know. I don't always. I, I say that. But I will also say this. I always felt that my life would be incomplete without a son. And when I say always, I mean for as far back as I can remember. And then one day I met Melissa, and then a year later we were married in 2004. And I was lucky enough to become the father to her daughter, Bronnie. Now, 
We desperately wanted to give Ronnie a brother or sister. But for the, for the next five years, we knew exactly how Hannah felt. As I'm sure some of you here will do too. Melissa suffered three miscarriages and uh, because of a genetic condition she contracted pre-cancer cells in her womb. Although she was still in her twenties, just, she was strongly advised to have a hysterectomy. However, she felt equally strongly that God did not want her to. A period of total infertility followed and I underwent my own tests. I was given a zero, I mean zero, percent chance of having children. Three weeks before we conceived Maddie. <laughs> I've actually revisited this again this week, trying to find a scientific explanation, because I'm like that. But I can't. can't find a scientific explanation. After a further late miscarriage, we discovered Melissa was pregnant again a year later. I would have been so happy just to have another Bronnie or Maddie. But it was finally to be a son, Nate. Now I have a son and two beautiful girls. Why has God blessed us in this way? I don't know. It's certainly not because of anything we or I deserve. And I now know that God does not work like that in any case. He has his purposes that we cannot begin to grasp. He had his purposes, enormous, great purposes at the beginning of the book of Samuel that he put into place. But also consider this. Two of his greatest servants in Jesus and Paul remained childless in order to fulfill the greater purposes that he had in mind for them. Now, why am I telling you those things about myself? Well, I've known for a long time, since I first gazed upon the scans of my children, in fact, that the strength of my faith, I would always be able to measure by just how much I really, truly trust their faith to God, whatever the circumstances. And I know that will never change. So let me just read to you a prayer that I wrote and I read on the occasion of, of their baptism in 2011, Maddie and Nate's baptism. I prayed this, Father, thank you for blessing us with Maddie and Nate. Never let us take that blessing for granted. I bring them before you today as my greatest earthly treasures. I surrender them to your love, care and guidance. Please help and guide Melissa and myself that we may always do what is right by them. Lord, please send your Holy Spirit now and may it dwell in them for all of their days. I pray these things through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Many, so many people think it's imperative to have their children baptised. But then they immediately go on living their lives as if there was no God. And by their lives, they model this notion that there is no God to the very children whom they have just had baptised. Do you know what I really, I mean really, want to say to such folk who, who ask to have their children baptised? I want to say, firstly, that my heart is bleeding for them. And then secondly, I just want to ask them this question. Do you really think you even begin to know God? The God before whom you are asking to stand and make some very serious promises to, on behalf of both yourself and your precious child? If not, then just what are you going to do about it? Do me a favour. If and when a non-believing relative of yours tells you they're thinking of getting their son or daughter baptised, then please, lovingly, ask them that question for me, would you? 
But that's for you and yours. Have you decided yet? Have you decided whether Jesus is Lord? Have you decided if he's going to be the Lord of your entire life? Not just for an hour or so on a Sunday morning. If you're at all, at all unsure or hesitant as I ask that question, please speak to me, or Stephen, when he's got his voice back. Please speak to us. You can join us on the Alpha course. The Alpha course is tailored to help you answer that question for yourself in a very unthreatening manner. Or there are home groups and Bible study groups where you can explore much more with your Christian brothers and sisters. It's because obviously every time I stand up here, part of what I'm trying to do is impress upon you how this is everything. Jesus is the be all and end all. The Alpha and the Omega. God incarnate himself and the sole agent of our salvation. Or he's nothing. There is no middle ground. So, have you decided in your head and in your heart? Because our children and our grandchildren and all of our loved ones, they know the truth of our hearts. <coughs> children can detect the difference between what is merely a hollow routine, even on a Sunday morning. They know the difference between a hollow routine and what is the bread of life and the living waters of Christ flowing through you. For out of, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Do you ever speak to your children or grandchildren of the things of God? Do you speak to them of Jesus? As just a nice idea? Or as if he is the living, eternal one? in whom their very lives depend. Unless you live, unless we live, as if Jesus is the one upon whom every life depends, upon the, our lives depend, unless we live as if that is the case, how will our children and our loved ones see it? If your children and grandchildren are the most precious things that you will ever have in your life, then the single most important thing you could ever do in your life is to do everything you can to ensure that they too can grasp this truth. I'm not saying it's easy because it's not. But that's how imperative it is. God told the Israelites from the very beginning and us from the very beginning these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Now, if anything that I've said strikes a chord, as I say, please speak to me or Stephen. We run a weekly Bible, children's Bible club here. We're just launching a Friday youth group. There are resources we can recommend. We just want to help. God's grace and blessing be with you all.